Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha, my name is Matt Darnell. I'm here, the, uh, the host here of Hawaii Tech Today, here with uh, co host here, Greg Jack. Greg, uh, good, good, good to be here again with you. Yeah, Thank so uh, we're, we're starting a new series here. It, it, it's going to be you know, small and medium sized business computer network. Uh, types of, of, of technology they have, all going all the way from the internet down to the device, whether that be a tablet or a computer, and all the steps in between. It's something very confusing for you know small business owners. The kind of technology they need, what they need, where they should spend their money, where they may be overspending money, and also talk about some of the security ramifications of the decisions that that they make. Great. Yeah, for, but before we get to that, we're going to start with our, our current events here. And, and you know, one that I, I was reading was, you know, I think this affects everybody whenever you're in public. And have you ever shoulder surfed? Dude, and that, what that means is if I'm here on my mobile phone, I'm a tall guy. <laughs> There's not many shoulders I can't look over. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at what someone else does. Do you expect privacy when you're, say, on the bus or, or you're, you're, you're sitting downtown? Yeah, so I have to reset my expectations, right? So when I'm in a public area, I mean, I tend to, um, uh, I, I try to not to look at other people's devices. You try uh, to not, I try to, not but you to. want to. Well, sometimes, you know, it's the light or something, you glance over, oh, that guy needs some privacy, so you let it go. Um, but when I'm in public places and I'm looking at my phone, I, you know, I kind of tuck it in a little bit, look at what I'm, you know, I need, I need to look at. But it happens a lot more um, than I'd like. I mean, you know, my kids do it all the time. I'm texting a friend, hey, you're, you know, you're talking to Jason or, or you know, whatever. So what I find interesting is that um, there, in IT, we learned a long time ago when people are putting codes into a door or they're putting a password into a key, keyboard, you tend to just kind of look away and then look back. So that's kind of like this unspoken protocol, but, you know, there's no real rule book for people, so. Yeah. and and. And I think a, a key point is people should have no expectation of privacy. That's right. Now, I was speaking with somebody earlier who, who, who is very knowledgeable on this subject, and, and, and I think that's the legal definition, that, that you should have an expectation of privacy. But if you're in a public place and you're watching a movie or on an airplane, right? I mean, person next to you is you know, watching a good movie, and you know, you, you know, I, I think you should expect Spoiler alert. that other yeah. people are watching <laughs> yeah. what, what you're doing. And I just saw a story today, literally today, that you know, someone had an Amazon Alexa, it's one of the smart speakers, and it recorded something and sent it to someone, <laughs> a random person in, in their contact list. Yeah. And it happened to be an employee of the, one of the person that was being recorded, and yeah. they called them and said, hey, unplug your Alexa right now. <laughs> and, and this is what you were talking about. You're talking about this, talking about that. So you know, I, I remember back in the 60s and 70s, you know, you'd always hear you know, the, 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 the people saying the government's trying to you know, bug my home, they're bugging my car, and now we're buying these bugs. I mean, they're always listening, you know, and you think Alexa, and, but even a cell phone. Like my cell phone, I can say, um, okay, Google, or you know, if you have an, I, an, a, you know, an iPhone, what yeah. you say, Siri, ask Siri, they're always listening. You just said it always. now, all the phones are going e Every on. phone, I, I apologize, <laughs> I apologize. But, but yeah, so the, the point being that, that you, know, you really should have no expectation of privacy. And totally if, agree. If you're looking at something on your phone, um, then expect that everyone else around you is looking at the same, the, the, the same, same thing. Exactly. And I think privacy is a really good point, right? So one of the news articles I read was uh, Google and their uh, personal ledger. So there's this um, video that came out, I think it's like nine minutes long, and they talk about, the video talks about how the, um, the use of data and data analytics is going to help shape how we uh, manage data, so at, at a macro level. So what that might look like is uh, decisions that we make, or uh, preference, preferences that we have, the movements we make uh, on the screen or uh, geographical locations, all those things getting collected now have some meaning to it. And uh, the, the trick is who's gonna manage the meeting and how is it gonna be presented to us and then what are we gonna do with that? Who owns that? Do we, are we stewards of it? Is, you know, Google's obviously in the forefront of data collection. So you know, my, uh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I will tell you, it makes me a little nervous that there's that much data uh, being collected about where I am, uh, who I'm with, um, 
Because, and I don't, and I'm pretty sure companies are going to be judicious in scrubbing the data, and that's one of the other articles I'll, I'll tell you about uh, that I thought, that thought, thought was interesting. But um, I think that um, when we look at the data collection, if we if we behave in a way that we don't expect that privacy, um, as as one uh, government employee told me, uh, Greg, if you have nothing to hide, then you have nothing to worry about. Right, and and there's three challenges with that, right? First one being you've got to collect the data, right? So collecting that data, and which means how do you do that? So like everyone, uh, most people cell phone, they keep the GPS on yeah. all the time, and it, it phones home. Yep. It tells them where, where you are. So that's the first step they do. Uh, and second step beyond that is, is you've got to correlate the data. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, if your phone and my phone are in the same place, that that's not worth a lot. But if it happens 10 times, chances are we were together. We were meeting for lunch and, oh, we were, we were at an Italian place. We like Italian places. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to get pushed ads, which is the third part. Mm -hmm. Once you have the data, what, what do you do with it, right? You've got to have a mechanism. And Google, are, they're doing so good at collecting the data, putting it all together. Like, I can't go, if I go to Amazon and look for something, and then flip over to Facebook, instantly I will see an ad for what I was looking at yeah. on, on, on Amazon. You know, and, and when you turn your ad blockers off, I mean, it's just crazy. It's just, they're, they're all, it's a, there's cookies, the third party cookies, and, and yeah, so. They even make assumptions, too. I mean, I, I was talking to a friend, and he was telling me about some of the data collection that if you ask certain questions, so, you know, one of the scary things is uh, you start, uh, you have children, and they start looking at asking questions online, and eventually those questions are correlated to either um, physical ailments or um, you know something happening, like maybe a, a, a teenager's pregnant or something. But they didn't actually ask that question; they asked something similar. But then uh, GPS has pegged them in the vicinity of, say, you know, um, you know, baby baby clothing or something. So now they've correlated something. But if you're sharing accounts, now you start getting ads for something that doesn't actually belong to you. It belongs to maybe, say, your, in your household. Right. Because your TV is so smart now. Now, it, now you can look something up on your TV. It's it's on YouTube. And then you can see all the history, right? So there's there's these things where I don't think as a society we, we understand how the data is being used to get our attention. And and the I remember when I was working with someone on an anti-spam product. This was back in the dark ages of, of, of email probably 10, 15 years ago. And it would filter things out. And this was a plastic surgeon. He wanted to get you know, things that had yeah. breast augmentation in it, you know, um, you know, male reproductive kind of things. He signed up for those newsletters. Yeah. But they were just categorized as spam, that type of thing. So you know, deciphering that information, what you do with it, who has the legitimate need to mm -hmm. go ahead and, and look at that is huge. And, and I think one, one thing, I, I can't, I think the CEO of Apple said that, but anything that you do on the web, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. You are. Are you paying for Facebook? No. And you, you know you're, you're you're the product. You yeah. know your you're, your Gmail. They're reading every single. They know if you want to know who's having an affair with who, ask Gmail. Right? They know because that's the back door. Everybody they're they're not going to use their main account. They're going to have a separate Gmail account. Who's talking to who? Shouldn't be. Yeah. So that 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 data, again, nothing you put online, you should consider private. I agree. Yeah, and not to say that there are, are with encryption, there are ways ways to do that. But if you're just using a, a what we call a standard uh, commodity commercial service, it's absolutely not 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 secure. And I guess to keep our tinfoil hats on, um, one thing I'd found this this is a real website. You can check that out, and the link will be down below in, in the comments. We'll go ahead and put put, put, put that there. Um, but there is a company called Location Smart, and they're tied into all the major carriers. Yeah. So literally, based on this, this, the cell tower, they, they can do a triangulation to figure out where, the, where your phone is. Not, not as good as GPS, but it's really close. And so you can put in a phone number of someone, and they'll tell you about where that is. So people walking by a store, you can push them ads for your store, whether you're using Bluetooth, you know, all these RFID kinds of things. So really amazing. So um, proximity I, ads have been, that's been hot for like the last 15 years now. 
And some people want to know about it, especially if you're a tourist, right? You look at Vegas, you look at here. People want to know when they're walking down the strip, uh, you know, what what meals are discounted or um, you know what time's the show going to start. So in some cases, it, it actually serves a legitimate purpose. But you know, the data collection can be somewhat intrusive. Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I was just looking at all the stories here, and it's interesting because almost all of them are ne ne negative. Like, <laughs> like, like, for instance, like Chili's had a cr credit card breach. You know, people took cr credit card data. And the first thing I think is, why are they storing that data? Why do they need to store my credit card number? Run the process, let me pay you for the food I got, and then sh electronically shred the data. Yeah. I mean, what, what's the point? What do they get of storing that data? Have anything that, that's worth stealing? Um, and then, you know, I don't know if you've ever, ever been to Chili's, but there's a little, um, like a little tablet on, on your table that you can order things from, you know, has a touch screen, and even pay. So I mean, you get unsecured devices those little skimmers that they will read your card for you. I mean, that is just such a recipe. Can you type in your credit card manually? You know? Um, I, I don't know, and I, I, I was there re recently, and it was, it was a slide. It didn't have the chip part yet, you know? Oh, okay. So the, the, I think the chip will help, you know, the, 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 yeah, the, yeah. the chip there. But. Oh, I'm asking because I got those temporary credit card numbers. Okay. You remember? Oh, yeah, t tell me more about that. That's in, in, interesting. Yeah, so one of the things that uh, my credit card company does is it allows me to um, associate uh, unique credit card numbers to a master credit card number, and then I can use that unique credit card number with an actual cap limit. So. For instance, uh, if I have a subscription, say, to Netflix, and I associate a temporary credit card number to it, I can put a cap of, say, $30 a month. If, if they get hacked, I'm, only, I'm out at most 30 bucks. And you can cancel it in an instant? Yeah, and it doesn't affect the master like account holder. So in the case of Chili's or something like that, you know, it, it's a little tough when you're at, say, Costco getting gas, but it, it drastically limits the the uh, the online vendors that I work with, so I highly recommend that. I, I mean, and uh, what, what, what company is that? I really want to. Yeah, you want what, me? Yeah, Capital absolutely. One. Capital. I mean, I, yeah. I, when, when you told me about that, I was absolutely flabbergasted. You, know, you yeah. sign up for something, you can say, and you know, you and it's good good for a week. You know, I'm going to use this yeah. number, and, and it's, or maybe one, one time. It's a one-time purchase, $300. Someone I, I don't know. Yeah. So worst thing that can happen is they they don't ship. Yep. What, 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 what I bought. Exactly. If they, if they take it and they try to go to on Macy's spending spree, you know, it, it, it's not going to work. So I think that though, that is the ideal because it, it's a mobile app. Yeah. You can be, yeah. So that is the fantastic of taking the cloud. That's and, good news. Yeah, that, that is, that, I think that is worth the price of admission at all. Yeah. I mean, it, to have that kind of, and, and when, when, you, when you hear about Facebook, they just deleted 583 million fake accounts. Now apparently they have about a million, a billion and a half left, yeah. but <laughs> 583 million fake accounts. I mean, how, how does that happen? I mean, who, who do you think in this world is, are those just people that just abandon them? But they, they say how they're many, fake. How many fake accounts do you have? About 18. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what, what some of the challenge I think is all these, and you've probably seen this, uh, you sign up for something, they want some kind of, they, they want to offer a single sign-on experience, uh, no problem, we'll make it easy for you, just sign in with your Google account or your Facebook account. So I, per, I intentionally created a fake uh, Facebook account just so that when I have these subscription stuff, I channel everything over there and I don't care about the ads. Because that's what they're doing, they're just selling data. Yeah, and, and I, I, I think, I mean, that, that's something that I've, I've always thought was a million dollar idea. <laughs> that like we, we use Office 365 in the office. And what I want, whenever you have to sign up for an, for an account, um, you can just click a button in Outlook that says, give me a, a, an account, you know? Yeah. So it'd be my address dot Facebook, whatever, yeah. or, or, or something. And, and, and there, there are ways you can do that in Gmail. I think if you have your email address and then a plus, Anything after the plus is, is ignored. Then you can create filters and all those kind of things. But, but yeah, so the way to do that, you know, natively within Outlook, just give me a throwaway account. I just, I don't want to sign up for this thing, but I want to read the article right, or something. Right. So, you know, just <laughs> give, give me a fake account so I can, I can click the confirmation link there. Yeah. So, so de definitely a huge, um, a huge thing. Um, Did you hear about Netflix? No. So Netflix uh, reported recently, and I don't know if you watch Netflix, but I, I really like this short series. Uh, you remember Lost in Space? Kind of. Yeah, Danger Will Robinson. Right. Okay, right. so they rebooted it. Okay. Uh, Netflix is spending. Is it a prequel? Oh, what's a prequel? Prequel. So, what is that? 
like happening you did a before couple episodes Lost before the No. Oh, like a storyline before? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what's a prequel? <laughs> Welcome to 2018, Greg. All right. Hello. There's too many terms. <laughs> so it was like a mini series. I think it was like too many terms. Four, four or five shows. But I, it did really well, so they're going for a second series. Okay. But they're, they're very interesting because when you look at content providers for, say, cable companies, they're always, I mean, th their job is to uh, keep you a customer. And the way they keep you a customer is to continue delivering content that you like. And that requires content providers. Mm -hmm. Netflix is an online content provider. So they're spending about 85% of their revenue or their, 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 uh, um, their, spend, it, their spend is gonna go to uh, their own uh, series. So what they would call Netflix original series, right? Well, it makes sense. I mean, back in the day, you know, they would, 85% was spent on shipping and buying <laughs> DVDs, Yeah. right? And, and that, that all changed. Okay, well, uh, again, uh, great, great talk. So we're, we're gonna take a short break here, and we come back again. We're gonna be talking about uh, small and medium-sized business computer networks. Gonna start with the internet, work all the way through. We'll see you in a few. I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech. ThinkTech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Hey, aloha everybody. Thanks for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Andrew Lanning, the security guy. I host a program called Security Matters Hawaii. And I hope you'll join us on Fridays. Uh, we air at 10 a.m. And we're gonna be talking about those security things that really should be important to you. And you know, maybe get behind the scenes on some, some things that you may not know about the industry or about products or even about your habits. Um, security is all about people, processes, and products, and we hope to bring that to you in an informative and um, hopefully a useful way. So again, 10, 10 a.m. on Fridays, Security Matters Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me. Thank you. Aloha. W w welcome back. If you're just joining us, you're probably watching on a video on YouTube, so you can rewind, just FYI, to have that there. Prequel. But pre yeah, you, you can watch the, the prequel <laughs> to this, this segment here, uh, our, our, our current tech topics. But again, my name is Matt Darnell here with uh, the lovely Greg, Greg Jackson, and we're going to be talking today on Hawaii Tech Today about a multi-part series on SMB Computer Network. There are so many small businesses here in Hawaii, five folks and below, and they really don't understand what's happening in their network. So we, we want, kind of want to take, a, take, take, take our time, work through the network, work through all of the different um, you know, parts of that. So if we could, if we, if we could bring up, bring up the diagram. This is probably a diagram of maybe a uh, 10 or 15 person office there. So up at the top of the middle, we have our internet connection, and that connects into some kind of a router. And the router uh, then goes to this thing we call a switch, and the switch is what everything plugs, plugs into. So let, let, let's start off with that internet connection. And, and, and so we're, we're gonna talk about different kinds of, of internet connect that you might have. You know, the first one we can talk about is DSL. Now, DSL is generally provided by a private line or generally by the phone company. Hawaiian Tel is gonna provide DSL. And that's generally um, the, uh, the service of last resort, right? <laughs> if, if, unless you're out yeah. beyond everything, you, you know, DSL is available to you. Now, it might only be three meg down and 768K up, but DSL is, is very, probably the most widely available, beside a satellite service that, 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 that's, that's everywhere right. for, for all, all the rich people. Um, but, um, you know, we, we, have, we, have, we have DSL there. Yeah. So one of the things that you know I like about DSL is because it has that saturation in, in the market. So a lot of the conversations that I have with small business owners uh, would be something like, I know I need internet. I don't know if they have fiber. Um, they may have coax. And then my next question is, do you have phone lines? So one of the best things about uh, being in Hawaii is that I have learned a lot more about uh, infrastructure. Um, I'm used to a lot more fiber. 
and when I came out here, uh, almost came, came from from where Vegas, from Las Vegas. Yeah, so very high densely packed fiber and coax okay. all over. I mean, uh, the company I worked for uh, did a really good job of building out the infrastructure. So, um, what what you find with the phone lines is that it's very difficult to push the amount of data that people are expecting today. And that's one of the reasons why you have uh, some of the people struggling, I think, businesses to get the data throughput that they need. Re you know, I think reliability is there. When you look at latency, um, the phone lines tend to be pretty reliable. They just don't offer um, the speeds that, that a lot of customers need. Yeah, and and now they, you know, they'll, they'll combine. It used to be two wires, you have a connection, and now they can bond them together. We have multiple connections. That gives you some redundancy. Yeah. Because you know, one thing that that we're, you know, Hawaiian Tel's biggest nemesis is the rain. You know, just when, you know, some of, some of the copper downtown is from before World War II, yeah. and the sewers get flooded just from a big rain and and every every wireless gets is soaked. big too around here. I mean, you get things like you know, it's raining, my internet's cut off, I don't know what to do. Uh, they have to take take uh, long shots of Wi-Fi from uh, you know maybe the middle of a mountain down to a building that may not have um, enough bandwidth. So it's it's really really interesting. But I think we're going to start seeing because we're so concentrated, especially in the downtown areas, we're going to see a lot of. Um, I expect a lot of fiber. You've got Hawaiian Tel doing fiber now, right? Yeah, I, I have I have Hawaiian Tel and Spectrum at my house. You know, or excuse me, Hawaiian Cincinnati Bell, yeah. <laughs> who's mine Hawaiian Bell Tel. South. But yeah, yeah. Some, something. Yeah, I think we talked about this last week. Yeah, <laughs> and ha have both of those there. So, so so DSL is generally available everywhere. If you have a phone line, you're you're going to be with, with, with within reach there. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about fiber. So w when would fiber not not be a good idea? When you don't have it? When you don't have it, yeah. The, the number one nemesis <laughs> of fiber is that install cost. Because yeah. sometimes, I mean, a fiber install is thousands, tens, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars. If mm -hmm. they have to trench, you know, they can only have to trench 10 feet, but they got to worry about the pipes under the ground. I, I, I've known people that, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to say their name, of the company that couldn't do it, Hawaiian Tell, but they were literally right across Bishop Street. They were trying to get fiber yeah. right across. I mean, within as the crow flies, 300 feet, but they couldn't deliver fiber from the CO downtown, right at Bishop Street. They couldn't deliver them fiber. The conduits were full. You know, it's just and all this old cable from from before World War II. So it it, it that installation, if you can get fiber and you can afford it, you know that yeah. type of thing. It really it is is the the way to go. Um, it's a it's a light you know it's light going through the fiber optic cable, so we're not really Lights. affected. I mean, there's all kinds of wavelengths being used, and that's probably one of the biggest uh, challenges that fiber is going to have. Where copper uh, phone lines, you they had to use existing uh, phone lines to push different technologies, but the phone line didn't have what I think the so coax. You know, we'll, we'll, hopefully we'll touch on that, but that's got certain density to it. Uh, fiber has its own clarity and density to it, the glass that they use. So the, the challenge is really going to be, um, can they use the existing um, fiber and how much, uh, how many different uh, frequencies of light can they use to aggregate different channels? So, and it operates very similarly, but the equipment is much more expensive, right? Absolutely, yeah. That, and that techno, that um, WDM, where they can they have different colors of light. So yeah. it's not just white light. They That's have right. blue light and yeah. red light and all, all the different colors, and it can tell you know one one from the other. So as opposed to just sending one signal at Dense a time. Dense wave division multiplexing yeah. or something crazy, right? D DWDM or something. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, so with that, so fiber, now you won't get that to the home. But like in, on the fibers that go from here to the mainland, mm -hmm. I mean that is such it's so expensive to put one mile of, of trans you know mm -hmm. oceanic kind of cable. They've got to they got to squeeze every little bit that they, they can out of that. So yeah, so fiber if you can get fiber and it's already installed, um, there's so much capacity in the fiber that for the carrier to split you off some some of that. Then it, it, it there's it, very little dB loss on light when you're splitting yeah. it, so it's it's very easy to channel it once you absolutely. Get there. Okay, so that, that, let's talk talk about coax and have that. And I I remember the days where um, the cable companies were doing real well because they could just run one coax up to a cell tower, and all the people were doing were were, were making phone calls, yeah. <laughs> but they can't can't do that kind of thing anymore. So is is coax? Are, are you seeing that a lot around? Well, coax is still really popular because of the uh, quality. Um, obviously, if the coax has been sitting around or there's, or there's too many uh, pieces there where it's kind of spliced up, then that becomes a problem with uh, dB loss. But 
coax is still pretty hot. I mean, we've got uh, coax uh, being delivered with uh, DOCSIS 3.1. Uh, bandwidths are still extremely very high. Um, I think we were talking in the office about some of the speed changes that might be coming, right? Yeah. So, and and when, when you say the dB loss, that's will be the resistance. You know, yep. the the signal degrades, kind of like fight when you yell at somebody. Mm -hmm. The farther they are away, the harder to hear that signal. Yeah. Yep. And and that DOCSIS is the you know the technology that lets them put the digital data over because the, it was first installed. It was all analog TV. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's, what, that's what cable was. That, God, that late 70s, when, when, that, when that really started. <laughs> that was a few years ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And now they're converting all the, now that I'm hearing the advertising that they're going to convert all the analog signal to digital. I think the analog's gone. Yeah? There, there's no more I'm analog. I'm getting on a TV where they say that you have to. Oh, it, 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 they're still warning you they're going to yeah. cut it off? Yeah. Well, they, they want to use that bandwidth yeah, right. for, 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 for the digital. Exactly. So, yeah, so what they're able to do now, the reason they've got um, improvements is they have these channels. They're able to put them together and, and, and just bond them together. So it's like lanes on a highway. You know, instead of only one lane, now you can have five lanes. So it used to be, you know, you get five meg down would be, but like the lowest service they're going to have pretty soon is 200 meg down. That's great. And, and, and be able to do that, yeah. So, so cable is, is a very good um, all, all, all alternative there. And then how about cellular? Have you, have you ever worked with, like, uh, there's, a, there's a device called a cradle point yeah. where you can like take a SIM, the same SIM card, you know, that little chip that you put in your phone, put that into a, a router. So when you talk about SMBs, this is really, really popular, popular as a backup device. You're absolutely right. Yeah, and, and sometimes they're, they're, they're in the same device. So yeah. I, have, <laughs> I, I have my internet coming from, you know, or, or from either from fiber or from cable or DSL, and then all of a sudden, if that goes out, then it's going to automatically switch over exactly. to, to, yeah. to the wireless. So it's generally you pay by the bit. The more you download, the more you pay. So very few people use it for a primary data service, but yeah, as a backup. Sprint, all, you, they'll give you all you can eat. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely right. And, and, and then probably the last one here is, is, is microwave, and that's generally more of a point-to-point. -point. Yep. Like if you're all the way at the end of, end of point, fiber install would just be crazy experience. Birds, go, birds going by, rain, dust. Yeah. So yeah, you, you have that microwave antenna and do those kind of things. So yeah, so d definitely a lot of choices that you have with there. I, I think we all would agree, if you can get fiber, that would definitely be the way to go. And then cable and then DSL would kind of be, That's of, a good, of, of, yeah. of the three, that would kind of be the order that you would go into. And generally, if you have a phone line, you're going to be able to get um, the, the, the DSL there. So yeah, so today, again, thank you uh, for tuning in. This is Hawaii Tech Today. We're talking about small business networking. We kind of started at the top where the internet comes in. Then next week, we're talking about the routers and then the switches and work our way all the way down so that one, you understand what you have in your network. You can make intelligent decisions on what you're doing, what you're buying. We want to help you save money, those kind of things. So if you have any questions, definitely go down into the comments, post it. Greg watches it every five minutes. He checks in. Uh, for that. So uh, thank you again, Greg. Thank you for coming. Have thank a great you. day. Aloha.